right? Thank you for coming here today. Appreciate this. Um, to well, uh, announce officially, the Subway Socceroos head coach for the next World Cup cycle, Graham Arnold. Obviously, we've got Chief Executive James Johnson and Graham himself. How it'll work today is we will go to James for an opening address, then we'll go to Graham for an opening address, then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, this is live stream, so we're live across Australia and across the world. So we will be asking anyone asking questions to do it into a microphone so everyone can actually hear the question. Um, so we'll actually pop to James now to give the opening remarks. Thanks, Beck. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. It's a very exciting day and a very uh, good piece of news for Australian football. I'd like to start with acknowledging that we're on the Gadigal land today and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, on behalf of Football Australia, on behalf of the FA board, uh, we would like to announce and we're delighted to announce the reappointment of Graham Arnold as head coach of the Subway Socceroos for the next three and a half years as we enter the uh, important cycle ahead of us, um, which ends at the 2026 Men's World Cup in North America. Graham's new contract will officially start on 1 February. Um, Graham's ready to, to jump back into work, but that's the official date of the contract and will run until the end of the 2026 campaign. Um, in making this appointment, uh, we thought a lot about the past four years, the pa past five years, I should say, and Graham and the team did extraordinarily well. Uh, the team led by Graham went through the most complex uh, qualification campaign in the history of our code. In particular, we played only four games out of 20 at home. It was extremely difficult and the team got there. And when we were in Qatar, uh, under Graham's guidance, the Subway Socceroos created further history by uh, completing the most successful campaign that we've had in our code's history. Under Graham's uh, tenure, we've also seen uh, many fantastic players come through. Uh, players that I think we're all excited about seeing in 2026. Players like Suta, Tilio, Kai Rolls, McGree, just to mention a few, and that's been something that uh, we've been very happy uh, with Graham over the past four years. He's brought some of those players through, and uh, certainly they'll be key players in the next uh, campaign. Graham's not only uh, done very well for us as a Socceroos coach, but he's a great person in the sport. He's had 56 appearances for the Socceroos as a player himself. He played a leading role in our national teams for over 20 years, uh, since 2000. And there's really no one else that I can think of that really personifies what a Socceroo great is in this country than, than Graham him, him, himself. As part of our vision for Australian football, um, it's been a strategic objective to ensure that we've got two strong national team brands in the market. And we're living that vision today. It's, it's come al alive. We have the Combank Matildas as well as the Subway Socceroos. The Socceroos are the second strongest national team brand in the country. And the Matildas, we believe, over the next six months um, will move beyond uh, rugby union and rugby league, the Kangaroos and the Wallabies, and become the third strongest national team brand in the country. This uh, appointment helps or further helps us bring that vision to life. It gives us stability and it gives us uh, a lot of confidence about what the next three and a half years look like for our Socceroos. We've worked hard in 2022 to put together a pipeline of coaches on the men's side um, with the appointments of Tony Vidmar as the under 23 coach, Trevor Morgan under 20s and Brad Maloney as the under 20 uh, under 17s coach and part of Graham's extended role is going to be to help mentor and support these coaches to bring uh, through uh, more coaches in the future like like Graham and Graham's going to support us doing that over this cycle of his contract. Um, we're also looking to Graham as part of his role to support us with our pathways and our youth development. We've got a lot of football transformation topics on the table from transfer systems to second tier competitions. And Graham's gonna be an advisor and a, um, and a supporter of those broader changes that ultimately benefit the national teams in the years 
to come. On the pitch, uh, we want to normalise playing top national teams uh, as we've done on, on the Matildas and we've got an opportunity this year because we control four of the five windows uh, and we share the same vision in that we'd like to play many top teams that we need to play as we advance in major competitions including the Asian <coughs> Cup but also the Men's World <coughs> Cup. So in, con in conclusion, um, Graham has contributed to some of Australia's most iconic moments uh, as a player but what he's done as a coach over the past four or five years has really propelled him, in our view, into a league of his own. He cares deeply about Australian football. He bleeds green and gold, and we're thrilled that he's committed to staying with Football Australia and the Subway Socceroos. And he's going to support us, and we're going to work together on bringing our vision to life over the coming years. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, please join me in congratulating and re-welcoming Graham as the Subway Socceroos coach for the next cycle. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you, JJ, and uh, thank you for um, attending today. First of all, I'd like to uh, pass on my gratitude and, and thanks to Chris Nicku and the board and, and James Johnson and the organisation for uh, throwing the trust and faith in me again to do a, another cycle uh, with the, with the, uh, the Socceroos. Um, I just love them. I just, uh, you know... <coughs> Every time I put that Socceroos shirt on or I'm around the Socceroos, it just, uh, I bleed green and gold. And uh, it's just a, a special, always been a special time in my life where, you know, whenever uh, you're in the Socceroos culture, you're in with the Socceroos, it's always a special moment. And obviously, it's been a tough road at times, but uh, I have so much belief in, in the group of players and, and the great staff that I've got that, uh, you know, this is just a start. You know, the, uh, the last was uh, obviously in Qatar was a fantastic achievement, but uh, there's plenty more to come, and I truly believe that. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to the, the, uh, what's in front of us. Thanks for that. What we'll do now is we'll take questions. We've got a number of journalists on the line as well. What we'll be asking everyone to do today is raise your hand, and when we come to you, say your name and your outlet, and then we'll go from there. We're going to lead off with Tracy Holmes from <coughs> the ABC. Tracy Holmes, ABC. Uh, a question to each of you. First of all, Graham, your stocks would have gone up enormously after the Qatar World Cup. Uh, they keep nominating you as, you know, the coach uh, of the tournament. Come on, Trace. So <laughs> I, I want to know <coughs> what were your extra demands? What was the cutoff point? The non-negotiable um, items in this next contract? And James, from you. Um, how rigorous was that arm wrestle between, you know, Football Australia, what it can afford and, and what Graham Arnold is worth? Look, I think, Trace, yes, I had interest from overseas, but uh, I want to help Australia and help Australian kids. Um, you know, I, I took the Ollie Ruse on last campaign um, to help Australian kids. And as I said to uh, JJ uh, in Qatar and that, if I did consider to stay on and I want to stay on, <clears throat> it's not just about the Socceroos. It's I want to help Australian kids. I want to help the pathways. Um, I want to help get uh, the Socceroos a home. You know, it's it's crazy to think that uh, you know the Socceroos don't get any high performance funding from the government. The Socceroos don't have a home. Football for the for <clears throat> the kids, the pathways. There's no home of football, and it's like, how can you have a how can you have a football culture? if you don't have a home. And all the years that I've been around uh, Australian football, it's probably over 40, 45, 46 years, always the organisation is here or there and, and get moved around and we don't have a home. And I said to JJ and, and, and the board that if I did stay on, it's something that I want to do, to leave a legacy for, for men's football, but also <coughs> uh, to help the kids. So. You know, again, it wasn't just a matter of just signing for the Socceroos. It, uh, yes, I looked at other clubs that I, I could have gone to in, 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 in Europe, had a couple of offers from uh, Middle East nations, but at the end of the day, I want to help Australia. I want to help the kids, but also <clears throat> probably what inspired me the most was seeing those fan sites, seeing how the Socceroos reunited the nation and seeing how many people love Australian football. and. Uh, just to see that was uh, something, again, that's just driven me even more to, 
you know, help the game as much as I can over the next three and a half years, not just the Socceroos. That's a great answer. <laughs> um, that's a hard one to to uh, to back up against. Look, Graham and I have um, been through some challenging <laughs> periods uh, over the, the the cycle. We had to manage COVID, um, which was extremely complex. Both, I think, during that period, uh, we we developed a lot of trust, uh, a good bond, and as we came to the end of the cycle uh, in Qatar, we sat down and we shook hands and we said, "Let's have a conversation." after the tournament finishes. Um, Graham was, uh, he was, uh, he was tired after the tournament. And I think the last Thanks thing for I said, <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I said to Graham um, post the tournament was just go have a break. Mm -hmm. Graham and his lovely wife, Sarah, wanted to spend some time in the UK. We said, look, we're not gonna go into a process. Um, take some time out, we'll have a chat with you, your agent. Um, and, and that's what we did. And it was built on trust and as soon as Arnie was, uh, he had some energy again. We started the conversations about the role. Um, we didn't talk to any other candidate. We made a promise to Arnie and, and we, we lived uh, up to that promise. Um, but in designing what this new role is, uh, we knew what was important to Graham and, and it's also why it's such a great relationship is that it's not just about the performance of the Socceroos for Graham on the pitch. Um, that is obviously key, but it's also about um, the next generation of coaches for the national team. It's about developing the next generation of Socceroos. It's about how can we leverage the pat platform that Graham has um, to ensure that um, the underfunded Socceroos um, get more funding and get a home of football. So it's a slightly broader role um, than what Graham had in the past cycle. And it's something that uh, I know Graham's passionate about, we knew he would be, and it's something that we think fits very well with our own strategy and also vision. Thanks, Vince. Um, just <coughs> curious to know your early thoughts on this cycle. It's a bit different to the last one. There's more slots in the in the World Cup for Asian teams, so presumably it should be uh, a little bit cruisier than the last time. Does that require a different approach? Are you thinking differently about how the team will play, especially in Asia, where you know the style that was played at the World Cup will have to be a little bit different, um, mm. especially in the Asian Cup and against a team that likes to sit back? I mean, it's early days. Your contract yeah. hasn't even started yet, but. You must be thinking about these things. Yeah, look, Vince, good point. And uh, <coughs> again, it's it's. If I honestly thought that we'd reached our max, I would have gone. But I, I don't believe that. I have so much belief that we have so much more to do. And I spoke to you know a, a, quite a number of the players to 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 get the vibe from them as well as if we if they feel that we've got more to achieve. And all of them were like, we're only fifty percent, Arnie. We've got so much more. And with these kids coming through, so. It's one step at a time, you know. What's great is that potentially this year we're going to have a, uh, some friendlies here in Australia uh, to build on that. But also, it's one step at a time. That one step and first step is the Asian Cup. Last time I did the Asian Cup uh, in 2018, it was more of a, a talent ID type uh, Asian Cup because you know I knew there was going to be all the, those retirements that happen. But this time, it's as I said, one step at a time. And the first step is is going to the Asian Cup to be successful and win it. Uh, secondly is direct qualification for the World Cup because I really don't want to go through that again. And thirdly, to uh, uh, achieve more than what we did at the World Cup. So when you look at those three goals, and I put that to those players and, and the senior boys, and they're all on board with that and they understand exactly what I believe in and, and, and what I expect from the, uh, from the players. And uh, so looking at that again, there is so much more improvement to do. And uh, yes, we can always look back and say, well, yeah, we went through a tough time with COVID and we went through that, but I, I still say this and I truly believe it. Yes, it was hard, but what it did do was build this great culture that we've got. And, uh, it, it, you know, because of COVID and because of the players, number of players that were ruled out, it created depth. And <clears throat> today is uh, a new day. It's a new campaign. It's, it's, we're starting it over again. There's no one, again, I said this last time, but there's no, no guarantees. All players that are eligible for Australia are on the selection sheet today uh, to, to be chosen for the, for the rest of this campaign. We've got some very good kids overseas and uh, Rene Mullenstein will be staying on uh, and he will be working a lot overseas to look at those kids overseas, but also there's uh, a few kids that uh, you know, have Australian passports that can play for us as well. 
and uh, it's important that we get to those kids as well. And uh, I think what we uh, achieved in Qatar will inspire those to play for Australia and the soccer is. I just wanted to ask you specifically about the last Asian Cup. Uh, obviously, it didn't end well. I, I can't know. remember that. How long ago was that? Uh, January 2019. <laughs> I remember it reasonably well. I uh, see. I said 2018. Yeah, so. There you go. Um, look, just your reflections on that tournament, where things went wrong and how much <coughs> you've grown and learned as a coach since then. Well, you've got to remember, 100%, but you've got to remember I, I had, uh, and the players, let's, uh, because it's more about the players. They were, they, they're under me for three games, three friendlies. We played one in Q8. We played... Uh, South Korea here and Lebanon here, and then it was bang, straight, go to the Asian Cup with, uh, of course, uh, everyone expecting us to win it. So, you know, I had to bring new players in, the retirement of Timmy Cahill and, and Mele Yedinak, and Mark Milligan was there, but we knew that he wasn't going to go any further, so I had to bring in some new players and blood new players. But, <clears throat> again, I, I truly believe, and, I, and again, I'm so appreciative with, uh, with this, is that stability is a key. You know, this will be probably the first time I can remember since Frank Arrock that uh, you know that we're going to have that type of stability, and I know I know, know as a player back in those days that you know to, to be able to okay we didn't make the World Cup, but to be able to continue and move forward, and it's not like we we got everything perfect in the last campaign. There's a lot of improvement on even the staff side of things, the resources side of things that we're talking about with the government helping with some uh, high performance funding for the soccerers to give us what is required to be one of the best nations in the world. So we've got so much improvement in front of us and, and, and cleaning up and fixing up that, uh, as I said, I expect a, a great three and a half years ahead. Uh, Graham, Tom Smithies, keep up. You used the Olympic team last time to hothouse <coughs> a, a, new, a new bunch of players. To what degree do you have to see that change? Because you are, you're some of your older players will be relatively old by the time of the next World Cup. Hmm. Yeah, look, I think uh, there is the kids are out there. I'm, like I'm watching the A League every week, and uh, you're seeing some kids there that are doing exceptionally well, and, and kids overseas. Tony Vidmar is holding more of like a uh, European type talent identification camp in in Italy in March. Um, and I just, uh, you know, as JJ said, as part of my role to mentor and help those three coaches, it's it's just so crucial that we get that right the planning and the preparation for the junior national teams because <clears throat> the Socceroos just don't happen just out of, you know, for a reason or out of, uh, just out of the blue. It's uh, the ingredients need to be there and the preparation needs to be perfect, the planning. So if I, and not if, uh, when I go and just help Tony Vidmar when I say that and just uh, in a position of just being there just in case because of all my experience that I've had, you know, to, and to see those young kids in the under 23s uh, to qualify for France Olympics next year in 2024, and again, it's just it's it's a compact again. It's not another normal cycle. It's a three and a half year cycle with a lot more teams, and we're still instead of playing 20 games, we're playing 16 with direct qualification. That uh, it's just so important that the kids are given that opportunity to come through. Yeah, exactly. And it's, as I said to the older players, it's one step at a time. <clears throat> and, you know, I've never, ever dropped a player or retired a player without telling him or just left him out completely and didn't say anything to him. It's I communicate with that and exactly like I did with Timmy Cahill, uh, Mele Yedinak. You know, I ring them, talk to them. And at the end of the day, yes, I... Yes, I'm saying that, you know, it's going to be difficult. We've got these kids coming through. It's your decision. Do you want to stay on or do you want to retire? And uh, so it's at the end of the day, it's their decision if they want to retire. But uh, it's about the respect for the players and making sure that uh, they're looked after. And, you know, why would someone retire at 30, 31 when they could be Oliver Giroud, Lionel Messi, that age, to go to a World Cup? It's all about what they, what their mind is telling them and what their desire is moving forward that if they want to do another World Cup campaign at the age 30, 34 because as I said before many times they have to get what's right at club land and they're playing a lot of football a lot of match minutes fit hungry healthy and they all want to play in that green and gold shirt G'day guys Jeff Smith from Fox Sports News uh, Graham um, congratulations thank you um, 
James mentioned you were pretty knackered after the World Cup. <laughs> did you have to convince yourself that you had the energy to, to go again or did you question whether you wanted to put yourself through that stress? No, look, I, there was a couple of clubs that were pushing for me to basically fly in the next day and start coaching. And I was, I just can't do that at the moment. I was just, uh, I was exhausted. And uh, because it was such a quick turnaround with everything. But uh, once I could clear the brain and, and uh, you know, and honestly, one of the greatest parts of this has been my family and their support with me taking this job. I'm my wife, Sarah, that's uh, super supportive that I'm away a lot and I, I, I have this passion for the game and my, my kids. Uh, <clears throat> come on, Dad, let's go to another World Cup. My brother saying to me, you're not leaving because I want to go to another World Cup <laughs> is also uh, great to have that as well, that you've got that type of background support. So... Um, once the brain cleared and then conversations and I had a, a you know, a Rene Mollenstein met up with him while I was in the UK and uh, we, we met for, a, you know, pretty much a day uh, just about the pros and cons of staying on. And, and basically it was just all around, do we think we've received, you know, we've got the max out of this group of players? And we both walked away saying, no, there's so much more to come, so let's do it again. And... Uh, and that was pretty much it. It was uh, just, as I said to you before, it's just my passion for, for Australian football and you know, my, my personal life being around mates and friends and uh, family, and, but also trying to help Australian kids and there's nothing better than, than seeing that and doing that. So can you win the next World Cup? You want us to? We'll do our best, 100%. That's, uh, but again, we... Uh, it's not just getting the football right, the government needs to help. You know, it's crazy that uh, we are a world sport and seeing all, all what happened <coughs> with those fan sites and seeing how passionate everyone is about the sport. And one thing, since I have been home everywhere I go, everyone has a story about where they were, the game against Tunisia. They tell me stories about getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning to watch, and the rest of the world don't understand that they saw those fan sites, but they don't realise the timing of it, that uh, the passion of, of the, for the game in Australia. And I was watching the tennis last night and watching the final, and, and when you hear the commentators saying, well, it's like 1-0 in a football game, watching the fans' reaction. And uh, that's what we can bring to Australia. But we need the help from the government because, you know, we've been underfunded for years. Underfunded for years. It's time that they stepped up. Jaleesa from Channel 10. Uh, Graham, I know previously you've spoken about um, the resilience that you had to show as a young man. And I just um, wondered, I know it's hard talking about yourself, but can you, I guess, reflect and be proud of the success that you have created? And are you a bit of a lesson to people in kind of choosing your own destiny and not even just in sport, really, but just in life? Novak Djokovic said it last night in his interview after the game, after the match. Sometimes when you get brought up harder in life as a youngster, it helps you in the long term, in the long run, because it makes you understand and live the tougher days. And uh, nothing is different. You know, we have here in Australia, I believe, so many fantastic kids and, and that can do something special. And, you know, it's our job to help those kids fulfil their dreams. You know, you can have those dreams, but if you don't have the pathways and you don't have the the right way to do it, then the kids' dreams will never happen. So it's our job as, you know, parents, but also the organisation, you know, we've got to treat every kid like it's our own kids and, and, and help them on their great journey in life, but also help them uh, fulfil their dreams. And you know, I'm living it. I'm living my dreams. <coughs> Michelle from Optus Sport, you've spoken about needing more support from the government and that funding, what else do you need from them as well? Programs or, or what is it? The funding will help the programs, but again, the home of football is crucial. You know, if there's something that we've missed out on that every other sport gets, NRL, club teams get funding and, and get tr fantastic training facilities. AFL clubs, fantastic training facilities. We're a national team. We play worldwide and we've got nothing. We've got nowhere to go. We don't have a museum. We can't, we, if we had a perfect facility that they would help us with, 
It could be training grounds to run the pathways. It'd be a, li a great little stadium that we could play in and we can have a museum to respect all those players like the Harry Kules or the Timmy Cales and Johnny Warrens of the world <coughs> that have done so much for Australian football that will not be forgotten and that will inspire the kids to become those type of people by having that. We're just going to go online. We're going to go to Melbourne to Joey Lynch, who's going to ask through the speaker. If I can just get you to answer to the cameras. Um, cool. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much, Beck, and congratulations, Arnie, on returning for another World Cup cycle. I wanted to ask you, your appointment, Socceroos boss, but there's also going to be significant um, other off-field portion. You'll be helping out with Ernie. You'll be mentoring the coaches. I'm just wondering if you give us an insight mission statement you have a manifesto what you want to achieve systemically philosophically in your role over the next four years for the broader Australian system see more young kids playing Joey in the A-League seeing those junior world cup uh, junior national team sorry seeing them qualify for the junior world cups seeing some great transfer fees of play young kids going overseas and clubs being rewarded for trusting the development of those kids but also, yeah, the, the success of the Socceroos is first and foremost because, you know, when, they, when they're successful, everyone, it inspires everyone. But I, I know I'm going to keep saying this, but uh, home of football, <coughs> you know, as I said, it's, uh, it's something that we need badly. Joey, do you have a further question while you're on? No, we'll continue um, down south and we'll head to Anna Harrington from AAP. Hi Graham, um, congratulations. Um, yeah, just uh, really just following on from what what Joey had to, to say. Uh, where would you like at the end of this sort of three and a half year, uh, is it multi year deal? Where would you like to see Australian football at? You've mentioned needing the funding, the home of football, and you've been meant you mentioned before about the expansion of the A League Men competition. You know, it, ideally, where is Australian football at, and what are you seeing um, when you come to the end of this this term in twenty twenty six? Where it belongs, and uh, you know, it's uh, you know everyone loves football in this country. When the <coughs> when the Socceroos play, the Matildas play, national teams play, every AFL fan becomes a football fan. Any every NRL fan becomes a football fan, and it's in everyone's heart. It's there. We've just got to get it out a little bit more. And uh, you know, if uh, yeah, you know, I don't have a role to help the APL, uh, you know, but it, it, I'm there for advice if 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 need be. But uh, again, it's just the pathways and the development of the game and <clears throat> making sure that we uh, that you know at the end, seeing the junior, just seeing kids fulfil their dreams. That's the most important thing. You know, it's when you see players go overseas and doing what they're doing today. It's uh, you know, it reminds me of the years ago when, you know, the Harry Kules and even when I went away in 1990 uh, to play over in Europe, uh, you just want to see kids fulfil their dreams and, and their potential because uh, they all have it in them. It's just getting it out of them. Hi, Graham. Tasa Fusi here from uh, SBS News. Congratulations again. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot about that qualification process for Qatar and I guess even um, that first game against France. Um, were there any moments in that whole process where you did think that you, you, know, you didn't, didn't see yourself signing on again as coach? Yes and no. Um, you know, if anything, I was more frustrated with what happened to myself because I was, uh, <coughs> you know, two camps I missed out on pretty much because I had COVID. And, uh, you know, so that was the most frustrating thing that it was, what I do love doing is face to face working with the players and, and and being there, but you know, against uh, Vietnam down in Melbourne, I couldn't go to that game. I was, uh, and I wasn't really there the whole time. Uh, I don't enjoy coaching from a, you know, uh, on Zoom. But uh, yeah, there was times, there was moments. But uh, the most important thing was always for me is, is it's not myself, it's the players. And you know, you always feel it as a coach that the day that it's not there anymore is the players. You, you get that feeling, that vibe, the players aren't happy anymore and they're not responding anymore. They get sick of the same voice and we have to, I'm <clears throat> not saying that we have to be careful with that, but we have to refresh, renew, and this is a whole new cycle. So yeah, there was there was tough times, but I just, again, it's uh, the belief I have in myself, but also in my staff, 
and, and the players that uh, there was no way I was ever going to walk out on them. Finn Hawkins from Channel 7. Question for James. What is your reaction to the ambulance delay at Amy Park and do you think it should be uh, mandatory to have them on standby at future games? Look, uh, this is a, really a question for um, the APL. Uh, what I will say as far as Football Australia is concerned is player uh, health and safety uh, needs to be uh, a focus. Um, so any mechanisms that can be um, introduce that increase that we would of course be in favor of but as to the specifics um, of what happened in, in Melbourne it's really a question that needs to be directed at the APL who run the competition um, if there's any off-topic questions we'll just remain it to the soft roots at the end we can discuss any other matters in the league or the sport I'm just going to cross up north now actually DeMarco Monteverdi up in Brisbane Marco over to you He's on mute. Probably. Best way to have him. Marco, are you on mute? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, uh, how you going? Good, mate. How are you? Good, thanks. <laughs> Just a uh, question to both of you all, if we can get. So, do you just talk have some games coming up in March? And if so, Arnie, what's the plans between now and then? Yeah, mate, uh, the organisation uh, is uh, still looking at that and uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be an announcement in the next few weeks. But uh, <clears throat> if anything, I'd like these two games, uh, if one or two games, to be more of a celebration for the boys for what they did at the World Cup and uh, to thank the Australian public for their support. Obviously, there's some players that uh, are not playing at the moment or that are injured at the moment that probably won't be able to come. But, uh, you know... It's, it's all about day one again and getting, getting the program started. But I think this first camp is more about rewarding the players who couldn't come back after the World Cup for the fans to give, uh, to give them the opportunity to say thank you to the fans and also for the fans to uh, yeah, say thank you to the players for their, their commitment and effort over that four-year campaign. Just, sorry, just, just further to that, um, it's a unique year, 2023. It's a three and a half year cycle and this is the first year um, of that cycle, which means there are more uh, national association controlled windows in this part of the cycle. So we have our five windows in 2023, um, four of which we can control and we can play friendly matches within those windows. So there's a lot of planning going on now that we've got Arnie uh, back in the role. Uh, we'll drill down and confirm some of those plans that have already been discussed, but we can say that as for the March window, uh, the team will be back in Australia and we'll confirm uh, who that'll be uh, in the coming weeks. But there'll be a lot of exciting announcements coming in the following weeks uh, around national team content for the year 2023. Thanks, Bob. We've got you on the line, Marco. Have you got any follow-up questions? Take it for the night. Um, we'll go back into the rear. We've got time for two or three more questions. So I've got Matthew at the box. Um, just going to ask, do you miss the week-to-week -week coaching club football? And did you give any consideration of going back mm. to coaching club? Yeah, I do. I, I must say I do. That's why uh, I want to be more involved. I, th I think that, you know, as I said, that's why I did the Olympic team last last time was to get on the field more. Um, but uh, I've got to also understand probably I'm getting older as well, that, uh, you know, more of a more of a managerial role is, is suitable more than a coaching role where you're doing it much more physically. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, at the same time, it's... As I said, it'd be helping the, the junior national teams out and, and the national team coaches and getting out and about and helping is uh, what I want to do as well. Any more from the floor? Look, that's uh, with all that sort of inclusion, thank you so much for coming. What we'll be doing is we'll be killing the live stream now. We're just going to do some photos and cutaway opportunities. So thank you for joining us on the live stream and the media who have as well. Um, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you.